thanks for coming. My name is uh, Alex Orenstein, and I'll be talking to you today uh, about a project called Sustainable Adaptation for Mali, Sustainable Technology Adaptation for Mali and Pastoralists. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Great. Um, so, sorry, does anyone use the other microphone? Is another microphone? Oh, is this better? Whoa, <laughs> too much. So, uh, yes, in case you're disappointed, the grass that we're talking about refers to rangeland, not marijuana. Um, I'm sure there's another presentation that you can go to. Um, but we're going to be talking about specifically how we use EO data, uh, Earth observation data, remote sensing data, to help pastoralists, these are herders, make decisions. So to give you a bit of context, uh, we're talking about herders in the Sahelian part of West Africa. This is the band that stretches from Senegal to Chad. Uh, it's very dry and it's very big. You can see on the right side here, uh, precipitation anomalies. These are, um, this is showing that rainfall is getting more and more erratic. So for people like this, um, this, this is a picture of a Fulani family in northern Senegal finding water and pasture can be particularly difficult. Um, here we see a family filling up an inner tube uh, with water to bring back to their herds. Um, so the appearance of naturally occurring water and pasture is of critical importance to herders. They have to move with the seasons and they have to migrate their cattle um, and all of their livestock to find pasture and water. If they can't find pasture and water, this leads to starvation of animals, this leads to uh, loss of livelihoods. So, but I want to impress upon you how difficult it can be to find pasture and water, and how critical being able to find it is. Here, you see the same lake. This is in the center of Mali, in Mopti. On the left, this is the wet season, this is September. On the right, that's May. You can see the three trees show you it's the same lake. This is not a drought year. This is not a particularly difficult year. This was a regular year from September to May. So if you don't have information ahead of time about where the pasture is and the dry season comes around, as a herder you could be in serious trouble. Another image, this is in the north of Senegal and um, this is uh, one of my favorite places to look at uh, in time series because it's a lake. And we can see here, this is the dry season, it's empty, and then boom, the rains come. And there's a ton, and it quickly shrinks as the dry season sets on. And now we're in March, April, May, June, and it's empty. And this is quite a large lake. So again, just to provide you context about why it's important to find this information. So this was the framework in which this product, project was launched. Uh, this was lodged in 2015, and I've been working on this project since then um, is as, one of the GI, as part of the GIS team. And the idea was to create a call center um, that herders could call into and figure out using EO data whether or not there was pasture or water in a place. And then you could apply all sorts of other data. And the idea was to take these data sets which have existed for a very long time, NDVI and uh, rainfall and small water bodies data sets are not a new development. They've been around for decades. But to put it in a medium that could be accessible. So the Netherlands Space Organization provided the initial funding and uh, there was a consortium uh, with SNV, um, Hofslut Spatial Solutions, a, a Dutch uh, GIS company, Orange, the telecom company, uh, a, a pastoral, pastoralist organization called TASAR, and then a French NGO as well was collaborating, Action Contre la Faim. And here's the basic logic of how it works. The herder here, in Gao, this is the northern part of Mali where the project is taking place, decides he wants to bring his animals to Tessit. It's a village uh, south of the river Niger in Mali. And he wants to bring his cattle and needs to know how the pasture is. Now normally he could, you know, try and find out if he has cousins or friends or someone he knows over there, or send someone on a motorcycle, which can be very costly and time consuming. So instead, he calls the Stamp Call Center. They get this nice fancy uh, imagery, some field data on prices, herd concentration, and then they load up the interface. And the agent receiving the call has a look and he sees this big red splotch over Tessit. 
And so he tells the pastoralist, it's not so great. Maybe don't go to Tessit. So this is the interface, um, what it looks like. And I think instead of doing this, actually, I'm just going to pull it up. It's accessible online. It's stampmally.org. And basically, you know, we will do a bit of a role play. Um, I want to bring my cattle to Tinhama, which is a village in Mali. Well, Tinhama was a poor choice. We are going to do instead Doro. So what happens is the, uh, the NDVI is available here. So the call center agent who's manipulating this you know, can open the legend. And uh, fortunately, it's in French, uh, so, uh, but I, I can give you a translation. Bad, good. It's basically what you need to know. So they can look around, and this is the last sentinel image. Um, and there is a textual output. Um, it performs a query based on the point, and it figures out, okay, well, where is the closest water body that was detected from Sentinel-2 imagery? How does the biomass production this year, how does the dry matter productivity compare from this year to the long-term average or to last year? And then we can get a nice little time series here. Normally, we have prices of cattle also loaded in. So there's a post-GIS database that stores all of this really cool price information by species. And, um, uh, but unfortunately, right now, we actually don't have it. Um, but we will soon. And then they can switch around. They can look at, for instance, the biomass anomaly. So how much, uh, pasture, how much pasture was produced this year compared to the long-term average. Uh, again, basic translation, bad, good. That's roughly the gross overview of how the system works. So, to go back. To give you a little bit of an information about the center, um, there, in the first year of operation, 2017, 2018, there were 55,000 USSD requests um, and uh, 1,700 calls. I was actually unable to get call data from the last year, but we were actually pretty happy. We were quite happy with how the pilot went. Um, and the calls are taken in Sonrai, Arabic, uh, Tamashek, uh, and Pearl, or Fulani. Uh, what's really interesting about this is that it provides a lot of information that technicians have had access to for quite some time. Um, pasture, water, price data, and it makes it in a very, very accessible medium. Um, there's a lot of work being done, for instance, on developing applications um, but that the smartphones can access to you know, provide uh, meteorological data uh, to farmers and herders. Uh, you see a lot of that being happening across the continent. But uh, in a place like northern Mali, where you don't have widespread 3G, um, this solution oftentimes isn't really applicable. Uh, likewise, if you're dealing with a population that has low literacy rates compared to the rest of the country. Um, and then as for the web platform, what I just showed you, um, it's had 27,000 unique IPs and 774,000 hits since 2017. So it is being used which is very nice. And then to give you an explanation about the data, um, we use Sentinel-2 for NDVI and Proba-V uh, for dry matter productivity biomass. Uh, Proba-V uh, is a continuation of the spot vegetation satellite, which some of you might have used. It has a very special place in my heart. Uh, I'm a very big fan of this uh, data set because it has a continuous archive since 1998. So what's really nice is you can develop long-term, you can look at anomalies over 20 years. And in a place like the Sahel in northern Mali, this is particularly important. Uh, it's quite rare that two years will look the same when it comes to vegetation growth. It's very much a roller coaster. So being able to have a long-term uh, archive is very handy. And then for small water bodies, these little blue bits here, 
Um, that is uh, also Sentinel-2. This is a translation of that text box that uh, you saw coming up. And uh, you know, it has basically every paragraph and then uh, where it comes from. So the first paragraph, water bodies at Sentinel-2. Then it performs a query uh, on dry matter productivity for Proba V. Um, and then here, the closest farmland is uh, 18 kilometers to the northeast, and that's vectorized field data that was drawn in. And then the quality of the pasture is uh, no data. Again, really uh, unfortunate timing on that, but that's a post-JS data set. It's also quite nice that we can combine this field data and Earth observation data. I'm quite happy about that. And then the next steps uh, where we're going through here is uh, we will be developing a semi-automated system for cropland identification. So this is quite important. Right now we have uh, vectorized field data that we've collected, but GAO is enormous. And it's, if you think you're going to get you know, on the ground field data for the entirety of a GAO, it's very ambitious, but it's just not going to happen. So we are uh, currently developing uh, some cropland masks because in that interface it is very important to be able to distinguish between cropland and pasture. Uh, not all of this green space is going to be accessible. And then uh, we're in the process of tracking dust storms as well and extending the service generally across Mali. So in case you want more, you can contact me uh, at rn underscore sa on Twitter. Uh, these slides are available at tinyurl slash cow call center and uh, the interface is open and the biomass data is available at uh, geosahel.info uh, where you can play with it, download it. And yeah, I suppose opening up if we have time for questions. So thank you. So after the, the, fa the farmer calls the call center, when he arrives on the place you want to go, does it, can you give feedback to, uh, to the call center? Can you call back and say your information was correct or not? Uh, during the pilot period, that definitely happened. There was, a, um, there was a period where there was a sort of initial validation that was, under, that was being taken before the product was uh, put into, um, what do you call it, commercial. Uh, operation and during that period yeah, there was a lot of back and forth between the herders and the call center employees thanks for the nice presentation um, so I think this was a G4AW project is that right yes okay yeah. um, so the business case should also be very developed then um, so how do you sustain this? So there, there's these calls, they have a price, and there is uh, the USSDs, I guess they are for free. Um, how do you close the business model here that it's sustainable? Uh, because your project's already finished, uh, G4AW, is it still continuing? G4AW is finished. Uh, right now there is another funding stream from the uh, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is funding the expansion. But as for the moment, uh, the calls are uh, 75 CEFA a minute. So that's about 11 cents. Um, and the USSD calls are free for the moment, but uh, I am... I I'm unsure if they're going to stay free. I don't have that information. So that is basically the plan, is that with an expansion, it will be um, sustainable. The operating costs, for at least on the side for Orange, are quite low. And a lot of these processes are being automated, so removing a lot of the human resources costs. Um, and it is reducing the cost, so the hope is to find a conversion as more calls come in. And uh, the, the products of Vito, uh, Vito was part of the partnership or they just provide, their, you use their regular portals for this, for Proba V? Uh, this is just the public uh, Copernicus data that Vito produces, so. Good. Anything else? Cool. Well, thank you very much. Oh. Um, so there's that one village that didn't work. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with like the gazetteer like issue in this type of area? 
It's like find f like, how to find that village. I mean, it's possible the person at the call center doesn't even know where that village is, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, how do you address that? It is ba it, in this case, it's uh, it's it's reducing the possibilities. So you figure out, okay, well, what's the nearest village that we know? Um, in here, you know, because if it's, for instance, not an open street map, if it's not uh, geo names, if it's not from any of the number of sources where we've pulled the village names from, it's going to be tough. Luckily, uh, the call center agents, for the most part, uh, have a pretty solid understanding. They're all from herding backgrounds themselves, and they're all from the area. And um, typically, like when you're working with a population who are um, mobile and you know, have a, uh, uh, and have geography built into their livelihoods, uh, usually being able to find the place you're talking about happens after a matter of conversation. So it does require a little bit of extra time to be like, okay, well, where is that near? What are we looking at? Ah, so the call center is in Bamako. Um, while it covers Gao and everyone working in the call center is from Gao, it's in it's in Bamako. But also other people from other countries can can go on. It is the, it's a big stretch to show them the map. Oh, that that was just to show the Sahelian. Um, band like the uh, the zone of the the agroecological zone, the coverage area currently is the purple box. That's where the project covers. And the, yeah, it's only Mali. It's only Mali for the time being. Uh, hi, uh, sorry I'm late. Great presentation though. Um, so, what's your your greatest ask or request of the open source GIS community? I mean, we would definitely love feedback. Um, you know, we would love it if people uh, would be able to, you know, play with the data sets, play with, uh, you know, the interface, let us know. Um, and then obviously as well, you know, there's definitely a need for new data sets. Um, you know, uh, there's, a whole, there's, all, uh, there's a whole bunch of much smarter people than me uh, currently at this conference who can come up with really great ideas, I think, for other data that could be integrated. Uh, relatively painlessly. So I think, honestly, yeah, just being able to look at the interface, look at the data, tell us what you think. How did you deal with the satellite edges? Because when you showed us the demo, I, I, mm -hmm. I think I saw some uh, satellite edges. So um, is it something for improvement or? Well, the, you mean like the edge of the scene? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Well, so here it's limited based on the project scope. So this isn't a, this isn't a limitation here caused by the satellite, it's the project scope. Um, and these have already been pre-processed before they're put into the viewer. Um, so this is, for instance, uh, a WMS that's generated uh, through a geo server uh, before it's put on here. Yeah, exactly. In here? Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Did you, did you work only with the pasture lands? Uh, or also oh, agricultural crop lands in, I don't know if in this project, but maybe in other uh, contexts? <laughs> Well, for this project, it definitely has a focus on herders. Yeah. Um, and in there, there is definitely a lot of work being done for, on cropland, but really as how best to avoid croplands, like how we can make a mask so that if we see, for instance, a zone that has a nice NDVI peak, it's not someone's farm. And the, uh, it's also one of the important parts of this project is as well as that it, it has to have a do no harm aspect. So 
the call center agent, for instance, does not want to encourage uh, pastoralists, for instance, to go into an agricultural area. Okay. And also, at the same time, the, uh, the call center agent also cannot tell the pastoralist where to go. You know, the pastoralist can't call in and say, okay, where's the best pasture? And then the call center agent says, that's, that can't happen because it has to minimize risk. It's, that's great because <laughs> putting um, herders going through agriculture lands or worked crop lands, it's always a conflict there. And it this is uh, also good that they, are, they know where to go and fix the... <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would, that's definitely, uh, I mean, if... This is a, side, a good side effect. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, definitely. And the, the conflict right now happening in the center of Mali, in Mopti, between uh, herding and uh, farming communities is a pretty clear sign of why it's really, really, really important to make that distinction. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I am very sorry. I had some, uh, I had some uh, little cow statues that I was going to give out, but I packed my bags very, very late. So you're just going to have to come to Dakar and visit me to pick up, to pick up all of your statues.